We're listening to the Hello Awesome podcast, and this is episode number 141. We are back, friends. Welcome. I am JC, and this week is Bible Study Week. I hope that you were blessed by last week's episode with Courtney Chavis. Go back and listen if you have not already. You will be touched. But today, we head back into the book of Genesis as we have been studying the purpose of life. Why are we here? What's God's purpose? What is our purpose? We're going to take a look at the two trees that are in the middle of the Garden of Eden. Don't forget that these audio recordings of the real Bible study sessions that I have every Thursday night at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time, you can find all these videos on the Hello Awesome YouTube channel under the playlist Purpose of Life Bible Study. And the notes can be downloaded from our POL Bible Study Facebook group where I post reminders for the weekly studies and all the things that'll help you follow along so you don't miss anything. Okay, have your notebooks ready. Let's go. Let's do this. Here is episode number 141 that I am calling Purpose of Life Part 3. Hey guys, I'm JC. Are you ready for real conversations about faith, business, and life? Me too. This is the Hello Awesome podcast, where I bring forth topics and truthful insights that will encourage you to make intentional choices and pursue God with your whole heart. Are you ready to say hello to the awesome blessings that God has for you? All right, let's do this. Hey, before we get into this episode, let me just share with you a couple of things some of my friends are doing. Over at Oneness Essentials, you can get handcrafted soap and beauty products that will make your skin fall in love with you again. Go to onenesssoapbiz.com and use our special code HELLO8 for 15% off your next order. Also, Jessica's Most Modest has some amazing clothing that you need in your wardrobe next season. Go to JessModest.com and use our code HelloAwesome for 15% off today. Years ago, when Summer Neal was asked to take over her church's social media, she didn't know where to start. She didn't know how to create content. She was not a professional photographer or videographer, and she didn't know a thing about how to connect people with online. Well, Summer does now, and she's eager to share that knowledge with you. The Social Pentecostal is a social media consulting company that seeks to empower the church to utilize social media effectively to reach the lost and to make heaven bigger by teaching social media's best practices to church leaders and creatives. The Social Media Pentecostal offers monthly online training through the Social Pentecostal community. Follow her on social media at the Social Pentecostal to learn tips and tricks for your churches, social media management, and content creation. God does not need professionals. He simply needs a willing vessel. Let the Social Pentecostal help you bring glory to God on social media, and together you can reach the lost and make heaven bigger. For more information, visit thesocialpentecostal.com. Okay, happy Thursday, ladies. I'm so excited for uh, you guys to be here, for me to be here. Um, This is really awesome. Uh, We are in part three of the Purpose of Life study. And that just means this is like the third time that I'm sitting down working through some of this material that I've kind of put together. This is not a study that I found. This is just something that I've been in prayer about. And the Lord has given me every week uh, to write down the purpose of life, answering all of our big questions. What's the purpose of life? What's our purpose? Um, Who God is? who we are, all the things. And so um, I'm excited and I cannot wait to get into it. So I've shared my screen again. If you missed part one or part two, I have those videos. You can catch the replay on my YouTube channel. So if you're watching this on YouTube, all you have to do is just go to my playlist that says Purpose of Life, maybe, a P-O-L, I can't remember. <laughs> But um, it should have the other videos there. It has the same logo, so so it'll help you find it. So let's talk about the purpose of studying the Bible, because for me, this was a big thing. 
coming from a Catholic background, um, where for me in the, you know, eighties and nineties, um, they actually weren't really big on, um, on Bible, on, on teaching, uh, kids the Bible, at least not at the time, um, unless it had to do with their, um, you know, Catholicism and their Catholic Bible, which still, uh, does adhere to some of the scripture. And, um, I remember going to CCD, which is catechism. It's basically like the Catholic Sunday school. And one of the biggest things that I remember as a kid feeling like, so like kind of confused was wondering why they never let me touch the Bible. They had one Bible in the room and they never let me touch it. And I was like, why won't I, why can't I touch it? And then I was always wondering like, why wouldn't they let me bring one home? And I don't know if they, I don't know if it's something that they even thought about, like maybe they didn't have enough, but I was just seeing like a Bible, uh, just sitting there. And I was like, I just want to bring this home. And, um, it wasn't encouraged, I should say. So getting to understand the purpose of the Bible and studying the Bible was big for me. So th- this, these are the three things that I felt in my heart when it came to the purpose of studying the Bible. The first thing is the main purpose of studying the Bible. Why it's important is to get to know the real thing so that we can spot the counterfeit. Just like money, there's real and then there's fake. And people can make do by passing the fake off as real every single day. But that doesn't mean that it's real, right? And so just because you think something is real doesn't mean that it is real, right? You can say a cat is a dog, but that doesn't mean the cat's really a dog, (laughs) if that makes sense. So like when you get to know the real thing, the Bible, what the Bible says, then when somebody else comes to you and tells you what the Bible says, you have been reading the Bible for yourself that you know whether or not they are true words or not. So we're not going to know everything out of the Bible, but if somebody um, shares with you a story in the Bible and you have studied that story and they've said something about that story that's not true, you will be able to know for yourself whether that's true or not. And I know for me, sometimes that was always difficult because somebody would tell me that something is in the Bible and I would just believe them because I never read the Bible for myself. And we're going to see this when we go into the word of God, especially in Genesis. There are a lot of things that people talk about, even with Adam and Eve and the fruit that they ate. And we're going to see what our our preconceived notions are in contrary to the real thing. So getting the, the purpose of studying the Bible, number one, is to get to know the real thing so that we can spot the fake, right? Spot the counterfeit. That way we don't have to be, we don't, we're not fooled, right? People use knowledge all the time to get what they want, especially if they don't think that the other person knows what they know. The second thing is to understand the ways of God which will teach us about our ways. Now, when we talk about the purpose of life, we all want to find our purpose. Of course we do. We all want to know what, why am I here? What's my purpose? And the biggest thing, the biggest, the biggest way to do that is when we understand the ways of God and we, we actually ask God these questions, these hard questions, and he begins to show us in the Bible the answers. It's also going to not only teach us about who our God is, but it's ultimately going to teach us who we are and who God says that we are. And then the third purpose of studying the Bible is to, this one's the hardest one, of course, but it's to receive correction in love and an opportunity to repent, which means turn away from doing wrong so that we are changed. Now this, I think the, First two purposes, people usually agree. I'm sure people would agree. Yeah, I would like to read the Bible so I know what's real and I know what's fake. Yes, I would like to read the Bible so I could understand the ways of God so I could know who I am through God. But the third one is really, really challenging. And that's because we have to recognize that he is God and we're not. And that's a hard thing to say. Because that means that we don't have all the answers and we don't know things like he knows. So the third purpose is probably the hardest and it's probably where people 
usually draw the line, right? I don't want to receive correction, even if it's in love. I really don't want to turn away from what I'm doing is wrong because I actually like it. I really don't want to change because I want to do what I want to do. And that's very, very difficult. But one of the biggest reasons why we struggle finding the purpose of life is because we are following after our own thoughts and what we think we know rather than what God knows and God's purpose for us. So I'm going to take us into a couple of scriptures here. If you have your Bible, feel free to look at it. Uh, I'll give you some time to find it. Uh, but we are going to be plugging along because I have a lot of verses today. Uh, and you can look at the app if you need to, any of your Bible apps. But we are going to go into Proverbs 35. And that's chapter 30, verse 5. You know, we're, we're talking about the purpose of studying the Bible. So these scriptures are going to kind of back that up. So Proverbs 35 says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Now, the first part is so important. Every word of God is pure. There's going to be lots of um, negative mindsets that are going to come into your heart and into your mind into your, and eventually into your heart about God. And if we have been disappointed with any part of this process of life, the purpose of life, we might blame God for some things. And we might think it's God's fault that, you know, I'm not married yet, or it's God's fault that I don't have a job right now, or it's God's fault that, you know, I'm sick. But when we talk about the purpose of studying the Bible and, and looking at the Bible, it's so that we can get clarity of understanding his ways right? We talked about that. And so when we see that every word of God is pure, that means that he really doesn't have an ulterior motive to harm you. And I think we have a hard time separating God from people. And so we think God acts like other people who have hurt us, but God is not not like the person who hurt you. And so Proverbs here tells us that every word that he says is pure. That means when we're reading the Bible, we can trust that he has allowed things in there that's going to be for our good, that's going to help us. Because the verse also says he is a shield. We think about an armor, right? Uh, A knight puts a shield up. When you put a shield up, it's a defense. It's a, it's a, it's to deflect anything that's, you know, coming against you. And he's saying that God is our defense. God is our shield. When, you know, that uh, unto them, to those people that put their trust in him. So if we're not putting our trust in him, how can he defend us? He would like to, but this, this comes to our free will. God is not going to push anything on us because he's a gentleman. A lot of people think that he's not, but he is. And so we have to put our trust in him. Then we're going to go to Isaiah 48. This is also going to help us understand why studying the Bible is important. Isaiah 48 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So our bishop, has always said that the word but is a revolving door. If it's good before that word, then it's going to be not good after that word. Or if it's not good before that word, it's going to be good after that word, if that makes sense. So if you look at this verse, it says the grass withereth. That means grass that withers away. It just is dead. The flower fadeth. That means flowers that are dying. Those are not good things, right? Then the scripture says, but those are not good things, but the word of our God shall stand forever. That means it doesn't die. It doesn't wither. It doesn't fall down. We can trust in it. It will stand. This is also one of the reasons why, side note, the Bible is one of the most popular books still in the entire world and why people still gravitate to the word of God. It's because it's alive. It's not a dead, it's not a dead book. It's, it's alive because it's the word of God breathed into pages. He's allowed his truth 
to be written um and 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 etched on on pages for us and sometimes it's hard because we think it's just written by a bunch of old white dudes back in the day which is not true because they weren't white but also that God inspired them through the Holy Spirit and God also has his specific words in there so that's another reason why we need to read the Bible because we get to know the real thing and not just what people tell us um we can read God's words for ourselves and Hear what he actually has to say. So let's go to Matthew 4, 4. So in context here, this was when Jesus, in the New Testament, he was actually tempted of the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was very, very weak and hungry. And the devil came and tempted him. This was right before, uh, obviously, the crucifixion. And so this was a test for Jesus. But of course, Jesus um can withstand anything um but um the devil was tempting uh jesus and was saying if you are the son of god turn these stones to bread he knew that jesus was very very hungry that he fasted and that he he could he could turn the stones to bread if he wanted to so this was a temptation um trying to get jesus to appeal to what his flesh wanted. And so the devil was tempting him and saying, if you could do it, why not just do it? Uh, why not just do what your body wants to do, right? Not why, not, why don't you just do what you feel like doing? You feel like eating, why don't you just do it? And it was in this context, in this story. Uh, but in Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answers the devil and says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It means that we are not supposed to be just sustained physically in our flesh. We can't live by um, just feeding ourselves, our flesh, our body, our, let's just say, our human nature. Uh, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God, that's how we can truly live. We can unpack all of these. These are obviously... <laughs> We could be here all night if I, if I unpacked all of these, but we're going to go to Ephesians 4, starting at 11. And I'm not going to go into all of this because this can be long. But basically, uh, the writer of Ephesians, the apostle Paul, was, wrote, was writing to the Ephesian churches, and he was explaining that God gave in Ephesians 4.11, he says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and te teachers. He's talking about the different roles that people play in a church, in, in the body of Christ, I should say, in the kingdom of God, that everybody has a calling, everybody has a job, and it may not, it, it's not going to be the same. And he says in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, perfecting means to make better, doesn't mean to be perfect, it just means to, you know, make better. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That means uplifting us as uh, the church. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, he's saying that Paul is saying that God gave apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, all these people who have different callings in their life, different purpose, you know, uh, separate from the main purpose to obviously help us get better, to teach us, to help us be unified in the faith, right? And this is why in verse 14, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Okay, that means that when we are together as the church together, different people with different callings in the church, when we come together and we unify, we build each other up in the faith, we help each other walk this, um, which can be difficult road of life together so that we are not tossed to and fro between people who are teaching us wrong things. This is, this goes along with getting to know the real thing 
so that we could spot the counterfeit, right? Carried about with every wind of doctrine. You have to think of, think about everything we hear now in this world. People are telling you, believe this, believe that, right? Different religions have different gods. Different churches have different belief systems. And we feel pulled in all different directions. And we don't know who's right. And this is what Paul is saying is that if we can just stick to what God says and we unify together, um, we're not going to be tossed to and fro. We will have clarity and we will know um, the cunning craftiness that people sometimes have that they lie and wait to deceive. There are people who are going to purposely deceive us because of what's in their heart. But in verse 15, it says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is ahead, even Christ. So it's just showing us that one of the reasons why we need to study the Bible and we need to come together as the church, as the children of God, is so that we can spot the counterfeit. We know what's free. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. And we aren't going to become victims of somebody else's deceit. And that's very important, especially now. We have social media. Everybody wants to be a preacher. Everybody wants to tell people what to do. Everybody wants you to buy their course, buy their thing that's going to make your life better. But is that what God wants for you? And is it actually going to make your life better the way God wants to make your life better? And side note, if you hear a lot of laughing, those are my kids upstairs. They're having a great time with their dad watching something funny, I'm sure. <laughs> so let's go to Hebrews 4, 12. This goes along with the third one. Receive correction in love and opportunity to repent so that we can be changed, right? The third purpose of studying the Bible, the one that's really difficult, but this is so, so important. And this is why when I say I am not the same person as I was when I started walking God 15 years ago, it's because of this. It's because I took time to read the Bible and I'm not tooting my own horn. It's just because I took time to read the Bible. The Bible and God's spirit working through the word because the word is alive, cut through all of my misconceptions, all the deceit that I had in my mind, all the things that I thought I knew about God, about me, about the world, about the purpose of life, And it cut through all of that and showed me what was real. And this is what Hebrews 4.12 says. For the word of God is quick. It can work fast and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. First, I want to say that if it's God's word, it's going to be powerful because it's coming from our creator. We've talked about that in the last couple of lessons. He's our creator. He forms us. And so when he speaks, that word alone is going to have power and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's a sword that you can cut two sides. And it's going to say this, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Those are very, very deep words, but it's saying that God's word the Bible, it cuts through to your soul. It cuts through to the spirit. It cuts through all your flesh. It helps your thoughts and your, the intents of your heart. What, what your motives are, um, is a discerner of the thoughts. So it will make you aware. It'll make you more aware of your thoughts. It'll make you more aware of your heart, uh, your motives. And a lot of people don't want to be aware because they would rather be ignorant and do what they want to do. But if you truly want to know the purpose of life, then we have to stop being ignorant and we have to start being knowledgeable. And part of that is denying what we want to do and sit down and actually spend time in the Bible looking for the answers that we seek and just say, I don't know everything. And maybe the Bible is not even for me right now, but I'm going to take time to study it for myself. And I think we'll be, uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised to find out that, uh, there's some stuff in the Bible that's going to prick your heart and it's going to touch you in ways, deep ways that you never thought would happen. 
So I want to continue on to, these are just the definitions that I kind of came up with based off of these different scriptures that I've read. Um, and also, um, obviously my knowledge from studying for the last 15 or so years, but the purpose of God, what's the main reason? What, what's God's purpose? He wants to be known. He wants us to know him. He wants a relationship with us. It's the whole reason why he created us. Why would God even make people? It's because he's a very intimate and loving God. And he wants to be known. He wants that relationship one-on-one with us. And we can find an example of this in, of course, the word of God in Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 11. He says this, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. Now a witness, you think about like a trial, a witness is somebody who saw something that happened, right? They were there. They saw what happened and they can tell you what happened. So the Lord is saying, you're my witnesses. You saw what happened and you know me, you know what's going on. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord and beside me, there is no savior. He wants us to know that he's the only savior. He wants us to know that he is God. He wants us to know that there is no God there is no God formed before or after him and that we are chosen that we may know and believe him and understand who he is. I love that. Now the purpose of us, mankind is to know him, that relationship. A lot of people, you probably have heard of people saying that God sighs whole in my heart. People have said that, but it's really true. Most of us are seeking after relationships to fulfill us, but the only relationship that can truly fill us, fulfill us is God. And even if it's confusing right now, even if you don't even know what that entails or you don't know how that's even going to work out, just you listening to this is working on your relationship with God, right? Just when you, when you think about a marriage, you have like, you know, marriage issues. You want to read a couple articles about it. You want to, you want to talk to somebody about it. At least you should, right? And so this is, this is kind of the same thing. You want to get to know God. And so you want to get to know the Bible. It's very, very simple. Why? Because your purpose is to know him. That's why you want to get to know him. That's why people usually turn to God when they have nothing left, when they have when they literally have no other options because they have exhausted all of their resources and our resources cannot fill that hole. And so when people either have these uh, crazy addictions or maybe they're just heartbroken or uh, and just really, really depressed, maybe they lost other money, maybe they broke up with someone or maybe they got divorced or whatever. Um, life can be really, really difficult. And most people actually turn to God and start their faith walk while they're at rock bottom. You've heard that term before, rock bottom. And I've heard it said, once you hit rock bottom, you find the rock. And when you look at the scripture, it talks about how God is that rock. He's that solid foundation for us because we're meant to know him. And that's why when we've exhausted all of our resources and we're not happy anymore, usually people will go seek after God who has been waiting for them the whole time to save them, right? There is no other savior besides God. And so we're going to see, um, let's go to Deuteronomy. That's in the Old Testament between Numbers and Joshua. We're going to go to six, four, and five. This is a very key scripture. And I know if you've been in church for a long time, you've probably read this scripture and probably passed by it. Um, which is unfortunate because this is truly the heart of everything. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
remember what the last scripture said, there is no, there's no other God form because he's only one. Lord our God is one Lord and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. That's our purpose, to get to know him, to love him. Everything else, all the other details don't matter if this one is not taken care of first. This is the foundation first, to get to know him. How does a relationship between a husband and wife start? It doesn't start on their wedding day. (laughs) Maybe in some places, okay? I'm not judging. Maybe it's arranged. But most relationships, okay, start with a, hey, how you doing? What do you like? What's your favorite book? And they talk about their likes and their dislikes, whatever. And uh, their skills and their hobbies. And they connect on a couple different points to where they're like, oh, we actually see eye to eye on this. Oh, we actually are, you know, compatible. But the awesome thing about God is that he is already there with that heart of commitment. He wants us to commit to him. But because we have free will, and we'll get to that in a minute, because he has, because he has given us free will, he allows us to come to that on our own. He doesn't force us to love him because forced love is not really love, right? And so when most people want, most people say they want God to do something, it's because they want him to force himself to do it or they want to force us to do it. But that's not truly real love. But let's go to our, um, kind of our chapter here. In Genesis, hopefully we'll, we can get through some of this today. This is quite a bit. I might actually have to split this. I'm looking at the time now, but um, let's go to Genesis 2. I, I honestly don't care if I have to split this as long as we are understanding the material and as long as I'm at a pace that is good for you guys. Because I'd rather get small chunks and dissect it than try and devour big pieces and not understand so let's go to Genesis 2, 8. So we have read in uh, previous um, lessons, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. Right in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We also talked about how God formed man from the dust of the earth. We talked about the breath of life. We talked about God being our creator. Uh, talked about God being our father. And so here we are. Um, after God has formed man from the dust of the ground, He does something really interesting. He plants a garden and he has man that he formed put right in the middle of it. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know if that would have been my plan, but that was his plan. So here's what it says. Genesis 2, 8 says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. I wanted to highlight in the Lord God planted a garden because I want us to know that he provides for mankind. When we talk about the purpose of God, obviously God wants to be known. And part of that is he wants to be known as our provider. God does provide for us everything that we need, whether we believe it or not. And so this talks about God planting this garden And he puts man in the middle of it. This is the beginning of the Garden of Eden. This is the first time this is ever used in scripture is the Garden of Eden. Most of us, even if we're not in church or we've, or we've never read the Bible before, we've heard about the Garden of Eden. It's, it's, it's kind of like folklore now. But when we read the Bible, we see, oh, it's a real place that he made and he put man right in it. And it's interesting is that he put man in a garden because he's providing he's our provider he gave life to man and then he also gave him the resources to sustain that life so he didn't just breathe life into man and then just said okay have fun you're on your own he provided an environment to help that life be sustained to take care of him and we're going to go to Luke 12, 28 and 31. 
And this is going to help us understand God being our provider. It says this. Now, when the words are read that you see here, that means the, this is Jesus talking in the New Testament. When you see red words, usually in a Bible. And luckily, my Bible app uh does that. It gives me the red words. So I know that this is Jesus talking. He's He's teaching and he's speaking to someone here. So Luke 12, 28 through 31 says, If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? He's saying that God takes care of the grass, right? He gives it color. He takes care of it. And how much more is he going to clothe you? And he says, O ye of little faith. Do you not trust in your knowledge of God? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, ne- neither neither be ye of doubtful mind. Okay, so he's saying that you don't really have to look for what you eat or what you drink. You really have doubt in your mind about where you're going to eat or where you're going to drink. It just happens. You You have it. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Our Father, our God, knows what you need. That you need all these things. You need to eat. You need to drink. You need clothes. He knows all these things. And they are there. We don't think about them. But God has provided that for us. And it says in 31, this is actually the first verse that I ever memorized. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Okay, so you seek the kingdom of God, seek the Lord and, and, and where he is king and all these things, everything we need is going to be added onto us. If we seek him, he's going to provide. So let's jump back to our verse here. Okay. So Genesis 2 9 says, okay, remember Genesis, Genesis 2 8 says the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put man who he had formed. And then in verse uh, nine says, and out of the ground, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So God put two trees in the middle of the garden, tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, choice between good and not good. So we have that free will to choose between good and not good still. The reason why we jump back and forth is because the New Testament and the Old Testament are going to corroborate stories. They're not, they, they were separate parts, uh, written separate times, but they flow together because the Spirit of God united the stories, united the words because they were, it's what God wanted. It's his words. And so we go back and forth between reading in the Old Testament and reading in the New Testament because they confirm each other. And it also gives us deeper insight into what God, basically, who God is, his ways, and then who we are through God, right? And go back to that purpose of studying the Bible. And this is one of the ways that we could do that is by going back and forth. This is what Romans 12, 2 says, and be not conformed to this world. You know what conformed means? It to, to be formed into something else. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So it's saying don't be conformed by the world, by what everybody else is doing who are not following God, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to have a new mind. And that's what's the hardest part, right? Goes back to that correction. In order to do that is by following the will of God. I do want to look at what this says conform means. Yeah, to fashion yourself according to, right? So it's like to change yourself. Don't change yourself to what the world wants you to do. The world means outside of God's kingdom, outside of God's family, outside of God's will. That's like the world. And so the Bible's saying, don't conform to that. You, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Cause when your mind is renewed, you're going to prove what is good and acceptable and, and, and perfect 
you know, what is that good and, and acceptable and perfect will of God? The will of God is good and acceptable and perfect. And so when you have a new mind, it's going to confirm that. We're going to go to 1 John 2, 15 through 17. And again, it says the world. And when it says the world, it, like I said, it's outside of really the will of God. It's, it's people who are following after their own will and not the will of God. Um, first John 2, 15 through 17 says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him, inside him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So it's saying that just like the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, anything we see, everything on earth, even all the people that we see on earth is not going to last forever. We do not last forever. The trees, everything, the, as, as long as the earth has been here, nothing is guaranteed. And so all of that is not going to stand. But when we follow the will of God, and if we do the will of God, we will abide forever. We will be with him, okay? Because there's going to be a different path that we're going to be on. And we'll talk about that later on as we get into the lesson. So let's go to, I want to just talk a little bit about the will. But what is will? When we talk about the will of God or free will, the definition that I could come up with is determination, choice or desire. That's what a will is. It's your determination to do something, your choice, your desire. Now we, because God is love and he loves us, we have free will, the freedom of choice. It's not the same freedom of choice that the world talks about. That's a different definition. The world talks about freedom of choice to do what you want to do. Technically, that is true. But God gives us free will so that we have the freedom of choice to choose him. He wants us to freely choose him. He doesn't want to give us free will so we can go do what we want to do to encourage us, as the scripture says, to encourage us to have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's so that we have the choice, the ability to choose him and do what he wants us to do because he loves us and his plan is full of love. The will of God is the foundational desires that God has. He does have desires which are rooted in love. Everything that God wants for us is out of love. Sometimes it's tough love, just like a parent and a child. Remember, he is our father and we are a child of God. Sometimes it's gonna be tough love but he does it because he loves us. So we think about a, a, a father and his child. If a father forces their child to love them, it's not really love and that child will resent its parent, right? And so if the, if, if the father, in this case, God, he, he truly has his desires, is, they're rooted in love, then he's going to also obviously want that in return, but everything he does, even when he corrects us, is out of that love to make us better so that we, okay, can, can be on the right path and we can, we can obviously be in a uh, right standing with him and we can have that real, authentic, loving relationship with our father, with our God. Now, the will of man is different. That's following what we want to do. That's following after our own desires. And that's usually rooted in selfishness and lust. So if we think about an actual child, uh, as much as I love my children, we know that children sometimes can be very selfish because they don't understand, right? They don't understand usually the repercussions for their actions. They don't understand why you can't say certain things that might be hurtful. They don't understand why they can't have, you know, uh, certain things. They, sometimes they don't understand why 
uh, you can't give them your undivided attention all the time, right? A lot of times children are just naturally immature and selfish, not in a, not to be rude or mean about it, but it's true. Children are just naturally rude, uh, not rude. <laughs> Hopefully not, but <laughs> sometimes, but naturally selfish and, um, immature. And so that's usually how we are when we follow our own desires, right? I like it here. And I'm just going to rapid fire read these. If you want to write them down and read them later, you could do that. Joshua 24, 15 says this. Now, to give you some context, this is Joshua who was leading. He's one of the leaders of the Israelites. And um, he really was an amazing, an amazing man of God. And he uh, really led the way. He was an amazing leader. And these are his words. Um, inspired by the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He's saying you're going to have to choose. You're going to have to make a choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Are you going to serve yourself? Are you going to serve God? Now, we're going to go back and forth throughout our Christian walk, throughout our faith walk. We will go back and forth choosing ourselves, saying sorry to God, going back to God. But as we stay true to what God wants us to do, we follow after his will. He will correct us little by little. And um, he will help us as we struggle in that area. But we have to make the choice. We have to make the choice to come back to him to choose to choose the Lord. Okay, then we're going to go to Proverbs 16, 9. It says a man's heart. Now, sometimes when scripture, when scripture says man, it doesn't just mean a literal man. Sometimes it means mankind. So men or women. It's just the way that it was written back then. So just keep in mind that in some instances, when the Bible says man, it literally does mean, does mean like a male. But most of the time, especially in this context, it's talking about mankind. So Proverbs 16, 9 says, a man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Okay, let's go to Galatians, the New Testament. I know I'm giving you guys a lot of scripture today. If it's overwhelming, I understand. You don't have to know this all right now. Just know that. You listening to it is actually going to help renew your mind. Remember we talked about renewing your mind? Just listening to it is planting a seed and helping you see things the way that God wants you to see things. Even if you don't fully understand, it's totally okay. That can come later on. Galatians 5.13 says, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Hey, okay, liberty's freedom. We're talking about free will, right? People want to have freedom because they want to do what they want to do. And sometimes they don't care if they violate somebody else's freedom to do what they want to do. Okay, we've seen this time and time again throughout history, especially now in this country, unfortunately. But the Bible says that you've been called unto freedom. You've been called unto liberty, free will. But only use it to love and serve one another. It's saying only use not liberty. Don't use your free will for what you want to do in your flesh. Flesh means your own desires, your 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 will. But by love, serve one another. Help other people. and. Get out of that selfishness, right? The selfish mindset, which is very difficult for all of us to do. And if we jump down, it's talking about keeping in step with the spirit, the spirit of God. Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Lust is, let me just say real quick here. I keep saying lust. Let's go to the definition. It's a longing, especially for what is forbidden uh, in the biblical sense right here. It's a longing when you long for something that you know you shouldn't have, right? It's forbidden. It's a desire. 
we all have that within us, this desire, this lust to help ourselves, to engorge ourselves at, as people. That's something that we may not want to stop, but we know might not be good for us. We can't help it. That's our lust, right? So Galatians 5.16 says this, I say, then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusteth against the spirit. That means what we want to do usually goes against what God wants us to do and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. They're contrary. They're, they're opposites. They're separate so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. That means the stuff that you would do that you're supposed to do. Our lust takes us off of the path, the good path and forces us to do other things. First Corinthians 10, 13 says this, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Okay, so just quick context here is that there's nothing that you're facing, no temptation that somebody else hasn't faced, unfortunately. We talk about the victim mindset in this country. We all have been through some things and there's nothing that anybody's going through that somebody else hasn't been through. Okay, now that does not negate negate how you feel about it and that does not negate your personal experience, okay? So let me just say that your personal experience is important, but there's nothing that you're tempted by that somebody else was not also tempted by. And it's saying that God is faithful. He's not gonna have you be tempted about some. Uh, 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 with something above that you, uh, above what you can, um, reject. And it's saying that he's going to, with the temptation, make a way of escape. When you are tempted, there's going to always be a chance to escape that temptation. And we're talking about the garden too. There's two trees. Okay. He planted two trees. He planted the, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, There's a way of escape there, the tree of life. And we know as we go into the story in our next session, Adam and Eve don't follow that, unfortunately. And we're going to talk about why next time. Uh, First Timothy 2, 3, and 4. Remember, in Isaiah, God said he was a savior, right? No other savior. And so in this scripture, it says it again. First Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of truth. That's it. He wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. God is not happy when we don't have truth. God is not happy when we don't know him. God is not happy. It's, it's not good and it's not acceptable in his sight when we are not saved and when we do not have the knowledge of the truth. God wants that. That's part of his purpose. He wants that knowledge because that's that relationship with him. He wants that. I'm going to get passionate here. Uh First Peter 2, 15 and 16 says, For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. This is the will of God that you, that we may, may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not use your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. When people use their freedom as a cloak, as a covering to be malicious, to be, you know, deceiving. That's not why God gives us free will. He doesn't give us free will to trick people. He doesn't give us free will to to just have us do what we want to do to get what we want to get, right? We need to be servants of God. We can't use our free will, okay, not using your freedom for for bad things. First John 4, 8, it seems like, duh, when we say that, but it's true sometimes, like, uh, uh, it's just reading it in a different way kind of hits home. First John 4, 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Okay, if you don't know love, uh, in God's definition, not the world's definition, remember, we cannot be conformed 
to the world. That also means it can't be conformed to what the world says love is. But God is love. Okay, let's jump to 1 John 5, 3. And it says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. I keep wanting to say grievous, but that's not what it says. Grievous. Okay. It just means that uh we need to keep his commandments. That's the love of God and his commandments are not going to be a burden to us. They might be, they might be a little bit um hard because we have to go against our natural way of doing things or we have to deny what we want to do but it's all out of love let's go back to genesis 2 so he took man he put him in the garden of eden to dress it to keep it that's his job um obviously his name doesn't say it just yet but adam's job is to take care of the garden and so genesis 2 16 and 17 says And the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. You can freely eat of any tree in the garden. But, and we talked about the revolving word, but the revolving word here, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shall not eat of it. You cannot eat of this tree. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, the day that you do eat it, you shall surely die. Thou shalt surely die. Now, at this point, death wasn't even on the table. The way that God made man, created him, wasn't in God's plan to have mankind die. We're supposed to just be in this beautiful relationship and this paradise with him. In this relationship as a father, as a child, where he provides for us, we have that communication with him. We have that communion with him. But he's saying this is your free will, though. Is that, is that you could choose paradise. You could choose, you could choose to be here, be in my will where I provide for you, or you can eat of this tree and you're going to die, which is very harsh. So God gave this instruction for a purpose that we must listen, obey, and trust in the Lord. And it might seem to some people that that was cruel for God to do. But remember, he wants us to choose him. He doesn't want to force us. So he gave Adam a choice to have a relationship with me and choose choose me, be with me, trust in me, or do what you want to do. Psalm 37, 3, and five, 3 through 5 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. He'll give you everything that you need. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee, to give, shall give you the desires of thine heart. Whatever desires you have in your heart, God see those. God sees all of those. And if you delight in the Lord, he's going to give you the desires of your heart. If they are aligned with his will, if they're aligned with his love, he will give you the desires of your heart. And it says, commit thy way, commit your way, your will, basically, Unto the Lord and trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. It's going to happen is what that means. So I have read, this is Esword. It has commentaries here. Commentaries are from other Bible scholars who have um, read and written a lot about the Bible as they have studied. And so I have written here um, one that I really like that I wanted to uh, read to you tonight. It's uh, Through the Bible Day by Day Commentary by F.B. Myers. And we are almost done, I promise. Uh, But it's very, very amazing what he says. He says, every man is entrusted with a garden that he may keep it. God's God's goodness is no excuse for idleness. That means being still. Whether your heart and life shall produce weeds or flowers and fruits depends on yourself. God's going to provide everything, but God can't provide your your love for him, right? So you have to show up in that relationship. We have that freedom of choice. We could choose between our will or God's will, okay? And we have these last couple of verses here that I want to go through. Okay, so Jeremiah 17, 7 through 10 says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is, for he, meaning the man, mankind, the person, 
shall be as a tree. This is a metaphor here. Planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when he cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Remember, God's going to provide everything we need. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Okay, so it's saying, unfortunately, when we follow our will, it's deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Uh, but God sees that. He knows that. And he's going to provide things for us. Let's go to Proverbs 4.23, one of my favorite verses. I'm going to say that a lot as we study. It says, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Keeping your heart with all diligence. Okay. If we quickly look at uh, diligence here, uh, that means on guard. Okay. Keep your heart on guard. Well, if you keep your heart with all diligence, keep your, keep your heart uh, guarded at all times for out of it are the issues of life. That's where things come from. How we feel, our choices, our motives. Um, let's go to Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Again, these are the red words. It says, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what a, for what is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Okay, it's talking about the world again. Okay, we gain the whole world. Whatever the world outside of God's will, outside of God's plan, whatever the world, the people and the people and the things out in the world that are not following God's will. Okay, if we gain all of that, but we don't have God, we don't follow God. Okay, what profit is it if we're going to lose our soul over it? And so we are going to talk about next week those that choice and why Adam and Eve did not make the right choice. So before God created Eve, he gave a commandment to Adam. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Every other tree was good for fruit, right? Every other tree had what Adam needed to sustain life. He could eat of the tree of life. But if he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he will die. This is the first warning or word of caution from God to man that's recorded in scripture. All right, so we're going to stop there. This will be, be continued because we're going to come back next week and actually talk about that, dive into those scriptures And I'm really thankful for your attention tonight. And if you have any questions, obviously you can send them to me, either Instagram or Facebook messenger, Um, email me, helloawesomeshop at gmail.com. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for this time that you've given us to dive into your word together. I'm so thankful for your, your word and that it's still alive. It's still touches hearts everywhere still changes lives we can we can fully trust in you that you have you have placed everything that we need into the word of god and so i pray that anybody that's listening right now if they don't have confidence in the bible if they're unsure if they have questions i pray lord god that you will open up their eyes open up their understandings that they up, open up their understanding that they will continue to have the desire to seek after you and after the truth that any um any plans of the enemy or any plans of uh, any of the, the world outside of your will that's going to try and distract them. I pray, Lord God, that you will um, intervene in those situations and that the desires of people's hearts will grow to uh, wanting to learn more about you. And so I ask that you open our hearts and our minds. Keep us soft towards you, Lord God. Keep us sensitive uh, to your spirit. And I pray that every person listening to this will uh, have a safe um, week and that we come together again next week to dive more into your word and to thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. 
If this episode blessed you, please take a screenshot of it and share it on your Instagram stories, tagging at Hello Awesome Live. I would really love that. Also search my name, J.C. Pulford, J-A-C-Y-P-U-L-F-O-R-D on Amazon to buy my devotionals and coloring books. You can also donate to the Ministry of Hello Awesome through my link tree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E forward slash Hello Awesome Live. This will help fund future projects that will benefit the kingdom of God. Until next time, keep your chin up, beautiful.